Good evening. Just gonna wait another minute before I start. Getting everything set up. Can you hear me okay? Can you hear me okay, Kelly? All right. So, peace and blessings, everybody. Welcome. This is uh, my very first live. Um, I'm starting my, or I am starting a business called, uh, Rose Gold Birth Services. Um, I named it after my daughter, Gianna. I had her in November of 2019. Her middle name is Rose. Her last name is Gould. So, um, that's why I chose the name. And so, some things to ponder as I go on through this hour is um, what words describe your journey through parenthood and what ways have you supported someone or would like to support or be supported in parenthood? So I'm going to take that question and uh, hold on. No, can you close the door, please? All right. So I just posted um, these questions that I want you to kind of. Hey, cousin. What's up, Samoya? Thank you for coming to my live. Um, but yeah, I just posted some questions. So there, what words describe your journey through parenthood if you are a parent? And if you're not, uh, what ways have you supported someone? What ways would you like to support? And what ways would um, you like to be supported in parenthood? Um, so I guess to start, who am I? Um, my name is Stephanie Jack. I'm 24 years old. I live in uh, Houston, Texas. Um, I'm a mother of two children. I have a four-year-old son named Grayson. I have a nine month old, her name is Gianna. Um, I am here because I attended Latching in Love's uh, Black Breastfeeding Week event that she had. Um, and it kind of opened my eyes to the fact that I never really got the chance to talk about um, the hardships and the ups of breastfeeding and how that's been for me and I'm sure has been for countless women but we just never really got the chance to express that um and so what has your perspective 
What was your perspective before and after the breastfeeding week event? So before, I was just kind of going in with the insight of a doula. Like, you know, I'm I'm in this role of... What's up? I was in this role of just trying to figure out a way to add into my brain another way to help a client that's pregnant or just had a baby and how to offer birth, breastfeeding support. When I left the event... I was overwhelmed with emotion because it seemed like there was another aspect where I felt like I wasn't heard and I just didn't get a chance to um, relate to another mom in a lot of ways. Um, How long have you breastfed, combo fed, pumped, and what are you uh, currently doing, doing? So with my son, who's four years old, um, I had him and I tried breastfeeding. I was instantly given um, nipple shields, instantly told, you know, I was having issues and to just go ahead and try to supplement with formula. I think I combo fed him, like breastfed slash uh, formula fed him for the first four months. And it was difficult because the situation I was in and having him, I felt like, you know, my mom at the time, I felt like there wasn't enough support from her in that aspect. My partner, what's up cousins? All my family coming in. Hey, um, at the time when I had Grayson, I was 19 years old. So I had no idea what was going on with my body to even have a child. And in the postpartum, I had all these ideas of what I wanted. I didn't know how to execute and how to, um, be successful at it. So with him, I felt all these different emotions around, you know, I'm the only one. So I'm blind following this path that I have no idea that I'm on. And um, eventually I just gave up. I felt like, you know, he's, he's going to do better on the formula. Everyone else thinks so. So let me just go ahead and continue with formula um, and just be done with it. I did feel defeated in a lot of ways um, with my daughter Uh, She's nine months, so I exclusively breastfed her for about five months. The reason why it hasn't been the entire time is because I don't have enough support to handle being able to be, you know, stuck to a pump all day or breastfeeding her whenever she needs. Um, It's kind of changed to a mixture of not really breastfeeding and other times just breastfeeding for comfort. So whenever she wants to, I let her... um, but right now she's on mostly formula and uh, she's beginning baby food. She's been on baby food since about six months. So um, I didn't necessarily feel as sad as I did with my son because I felt like, you know, I do feel the frustration on the fact that if I have, if I had a village that understood how to support someone that's breastfeeding and how to ensure that I'm breastfeeding her when I can and how to offer that and, you know, contribute to that space, I would still be doing it as much as I was. But I'm also at a stage in my life where I'm trying to start a business and I'm also doing virtual pre-K for my son and I'm doing a plethora of things and also need my own self-care and time to myself. So, I mean, it is what it is. Um, And in the times that I am able to breastfeed her, I do feel good about it um what lactation education did you receive during your pregnancies so the only lactation information I got was right after having my child so with Grayson you know it was like the the lactation consultant came in and you know they they tried to help but there was an issue with with latching which is what I hear a lot of moms go through there's this difficulty I felt like something was wrong with my nipples but it really wasn't um at all with with now breastfeeding my daughter you can make a milk formula with sea moss and raw hemp milk as a substitute for your milk it will provide her with all the vitamins and minerals she needs thank you so much because I'm going to stop buying formula because I really wanted Gianna to be on as vegan of a diet as possible she's the only one I believe in my household who is eating like what she is meant to be eating as far as like alkaline 
um, and holistic um, living. So I appreciate you giving me that. Please DM me what you just messaged me so I don't forget um, because I'm interested in making her um, a formula that doesn't have dairy in it. Um, But back to the uh, lactation education, I really didn't get any any guidance. No other women in my family uh, knew anything about breastfeeding. Unfortunately, some of the nurses slash providers don't have the knowledge either. True. So it wasn't until I did the, I attended the webinar that um, I realized that OBGYNs and pediatricians don't actually study breastfeeding as part of their curriculum. So not only are we trusting them with our bodies in the birthing space, we're also giving them the right to tell us how to feed our children. Um, she uses hemp seeds, sea moss, and dates. Yes, my sister makes her son's formula as well. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate these gems, truly, because today she's stopping the formula. So I appreciate y'all. Um, let me see. If you stopped breastfeeding slash pumping, what contributed most with both children? Was it lack of support, low milk supply, or return to work? Okay. So with my son, um, I was working at Chick-fil-A. I was walking to work every day. I ended up uh, putting my two weeks notice in about a month before I had uh, I had him. And fortunately, my mom was able to take care of me in addition to two other children um, at that time. Plus, uh, my partner uh, stayed with me for about a month and a half to two months during that time. And so, um, let me see. I feel like the lack of support was the big issue. Like I didn't have to worry about returning to work. It was just that my mom had never seen it. My grandmother didn't really breastfeed her children. And so it was a lot of back and forth tension at that time because during the postpartum, my partner stayed with us, like I said, and she allowed him to stay, but there was that tension of issues that she had with him. So I didn't necessarily feel comfortable you know, dealing with the baby crying. I had to make sure he was quiet all the time. Um, and then just having no real familial support in that aspect. With my daughter, uh, I put in my um, unemployment because I was not only working at the airport, I was doubling as a union rep. So I was working for the union that whole time. And so they basically set me up to be paid by unemployment that whole time. And I went into quarantine in November before this whole uh, pandemic began. I just started being at home and I was taken care of, thankfully. And so I feel like that wasn't an issue. Now it is because I'm starting my own business and unemployment is constantly fluctuating. And I'm in a in a space where I need to, I'm on this, this stressor, like you need to get a job, you need to do all these things. But then it's the other side of me, like, okay, go ahead and pursue your dream while you can and so while I have all the studying to do and all the other things with a whole other child I felt like my partner there's some struggle there too because he's learning how to be a different type of uh spouse or husband role or father role than he's ever seen so with that being said I didn't necessarily get that initial support like I wish I could have um hey stormy thank you for coming hey auntie and melanie thank you for showing up um have you ever attended a breastfeeding support group if not why not so i had no idea breastfeeding support groups really just existed thank you you are always beautiful thank you stormy um i feel like i never really knew about breastfeeding support groups Felt like there wasn't something that was told during my discharge. I feel like WIC sometimes is just to show up to get the benefits and dip. There isn't any real lactation consultants there. I mean, you can talk to them about it. They'll mention it, but um, there's there's no follow through in care and support. So I feel like that's why doulas are here. That's why you know um, a new generation of birth workers are here so that we can transform that. 
Um, how did you bond with your children through breastfeeding? With my son, I felt more of a stress. Like, okay, I need to make sure I have the uh, the amount of milk that he needs. You know, there's always that stress in the mom's mind. Like, am I doing what I'm supposed to? Because I'm used to seeing formula bottles being eight ounces straight up, you know, with the cereal in it, all of that. And um, I was really my own critic. And sometimes I was my worst um, in a lot of aspects. So I don't think that I was able to. Um, dang, I lost my, my train of thought. Yeah, I don't don't think I was able to bond with him in the ways that I wanted to because I was so worried about what I wasn't doing right. With my daughter, it's it's crazy how I I felt an innate connection to her since birth. I felt an immediate, um, like, mother bear. Like, I want to, you know, hide away, protect her, and be in a space with her whenever we are you know breastfeeding whenever we are together we got to do that uh skin to skin even at home i would put her in my shirt um and so i could feel that uh that love chemical oxytocin all of that connection with her and so it's it's vastly different than what i went through with my son i had to learn to bond with him outside of breastfeeding um, how has your partner's role been in both journeys? What has changed? Ooh, okay. So with my with my partner, because we've been together about eight years, um, with my son, we were living long distance. And so there was already issues in our relationship as far as like communication, the work that needed to be put in for us to not only ignore what our family say about us on a daily basis and criticize and stuff like that. Um, but there was also issues in what I envisioned in my own mind for what his role was supposed to be versus now. So with my son, for example, what a lot of guys, I won't say all of them because there are some that already know what to do. Um, but for most guys, they're like, okay, I'm following your lead. Like whatever it is you want, I'm here. You know, what do you want to do? That's their, that's their um, mindset. Or in my experience, that was his mindset with just even going through with the pregnancy. But when we're in the breastfeeding, it's like, okay, I don't, you know, I'm not really just knowing what it is. And I feel like that's where um, a support group could have came in handy. So um, with Gianna, I was very clear on what I wanted. I was very like, you know, I want this type of birth. I want to for sure breastfeed her. I want all this stuff. And so he's really still in that same realm of like, I'm not really sure, but I know for sure that I want to support you through that. Like I'm here, you know, I'll, I'll ask you questions so that you can get your, your brain going on stuff and whatever ways that you need, you know, let me know. So it's, it's, it's similar, but it has changed with, um, the time, um, how have you been treated while breastfeeding? What stigmas, if any, have you faced medically and with family? So with um, with my son, okay, like I said, I was, I was pumping him. I had this old school um, Medela pump. It was noisy. It was, you know, so my mom, it would be like, you know, she didn't, she had to sleep. You know, because she was working all these hours. So it was like part of her did have the, the, you know, the stress of a new baby in the house. And then part of it was just like whatever the issue she had at the time. So it was like, okay, you know, the baby doesn't need to be crying. You know, don't try to freeze any of that milk because it's snack milk. That's her little joke that she has even to this day. But that used to really stress me out because it's like, okay, it's snack milk. So it's not fulfilling my baby. It's not filling her up. Um. And then when I tried to begin supplementing, I would find formulas that were specifically meant for supplementing. But to her, that was like the milk wasn't thick enough, maybe in her mind, to keep the baby full. So she wanted me to just get whatever other type of formula. Have you ever had negative backlash in public? Um, Not as much as I have had in my own house. I've had like, I remember being in postpartum my mom and my brother's coming in the house. So they, you know, they saw me pull out my boob 
for the first time and like my mom had to rush in and she's like you know you can't have your boob out you know put it away so I'm thinking too maybe I should have made it clear that in my own house that you know this is what's to expect don't come in if you're gonna try to you know condition me but in public in other areas I feel like I'm, I'm around other women that breastfeed so I'll just breastfeed I believe that now stuff is starting to change um if so how did you deal with it so it's kind of like what I used to do with um with the work that I used to do at the airport when so when somebody was, would come with me in public come to me and try to you know question me about what I was doing with my child um I would just kind of reverse that back on them and just you know go and be in my own space but again like I, I didn't necessarily get to experience as much of the public backlash I do wonder but for the most part where I am right now I'm I feel more freer to just pull my you know to breastfeed my daughter whether I'm covered or not versus you know being around other people I feel like once I've gotten with my friends and I you know some people that have come to visit me in the past and they see me breastfeeding her it's like oh go ahead and put your boob away so how am I supposed to feed the baby um yeah let's see uh but i would recommend like if you're in a in a space like because like for example in the workspace a lot of times you don't have a breastfeeding area that's something that you need to discuss before you even show back up to the workplace (laughs) that they have an area that's not the restroom but if you're out just on a regular day stroll and somebody's talking to you you know um, how to handle conflicts like that. It's like, you know, I'm in my space, you know, I don't need you to, to interfere with anything going on with me and my child. If you have an issue with what's happening here, which is legal in 50 States, I believe, go ahead and go on about your business, you know? Um, thank you. Let me see. But yeah, back to the, just back to the family stigmas. Because I feel like not just with breastfeeding, whatever feeding you choose to do, um, a lot of our families are stuck in these ways of, okay, we're just going to, because we don't know anything about what you're doing. The only thing we can do is offer you the handed down myths and stigmas regarding feeding. So I remember being asked um you know by my partner side of the family like okay when are you gonna give him baby food or or cereal then it became okay you know I said you know I like what what the doctor says or what I feel like is medically okay which is around six months when they've already started to grow teeth my child got his teeth at um Grayson got his teeth at four months Gianna did as well so it was like okay are they ready for food now I'm like, no, I'm just going to wait until they're six months because I have this idea in my mind of what is the best for my child. And then it became, I would have, relative, you know, extended relatives or relative in-laws that would threaten like, oh, when they're with me, I'm going to make sure I put cereal in the bottle or, you know, I'm going to uh, feed them what I feel like I want to feed them. So there, there would be this fight or flight stress that would pop up in me that I didn't even know, you know, was contributing to postpartum depression, was contributing to anxiety and depression as a whole, because you don't trust me to feed my child. And you are used to feeding a child until they're sleepy. You want them to be asleep and not waking up in the middle of the night. If they are waking up in the middle of the night, there's this difference of what is comfortable with people. But to me, it just seems like you don't really want to engage with the child anymore. You want to put them to sleep, be done with them. And you don't care if they choke, possibly die on that cereal that you poked a thick hole inside the nip, you know. But, um, yeah. Uh, what support did you have? What support do you have? So, with my son... It was really just me. Um, Most of my friends, if not all of my friends, were not having children at that time because I believe I was having a child during a time where I was supposed to be in college, graduating. Hi, Aunt Karen. Um, Having a child at a time where all my peers 
were, you know, graduating and doing all these things that were deemed success. And so I didn't really have anyone to rely on or connect to any women that I or girls that I saw having children in high school with me. You know, we were judging them. We were like, ooh, you know, and they were going through those situations alone. And now I, you know, I'm not able to connect with those women. I mean, of course I can go and search for them, but you know what I mean. Uh, uh, I can't stand that cereal in the bottle stuff. And we have to stand our ground. Like if you want to feed your child breast milk exclusively, whatever anyone has to say about it is null and void. Thank you. And so I feel like the thing with that too is, is that there is this dynamic, which I would love to expand on where not only your your partner's family but even your own family has their views and insights on what they think you need to be doing for yourself and your child that's not just with parenthood that's with pretty much everything and i feel like it's a pressure to be like okay you know your your husband partner whoever you're telling them you know hey make sure that your mom understands this they pretty much know what you want and then they have to be challenged to to also stand their ground and enforce the, you know, enforce the rules. But I feel like there's a lot of stress in that because I have someone in my life who's like, you know, doesn't really want to rock the boat, which a lot of people don't. And it's like, you have to just say what needs to be said. And then it's like, if I'm just speaking like how I'm speaking with y'all, that's considered aggressive. That's considered, you know, rude. But is it rude for me to speak my truth or is it rude for you to impose your views onto me and mine, you know? Um, but as far as the support with my son, I didn't necessarily have anybody. My mom was there and I was just beginning my relationship with my brothers because they were young. I was, you know, kind of there for them as the big sister, you know, extra, you know, motherly role, but more like, um, that annoying big sister that's always, you know, checking in on them, whooping them, stuff like that. So I didn't really have anybody in my corner. It's rude for them to impose their views. Of course, it's it's very rude. And I feel like, you know, once we start to express, you know, show that mirror on how they're behaving, like, okay, this is how it makes me feel when you do X, Y, and Z. They either retreat or, you know, decide to withhold that, you know? So I feel like instead of us having a relationship or you asking me, okay, so why, why are you choosing to wait to give your baby cereal? Or why are you breastfeeding? What are the benefits of you breastfeeding your child while you're sick? Are you supposed to be feeding your child while you're, you know, at risk of getting COVID? Like what, if you have all these different things in your mind, instead of you shutting down and just responding with what can be viewed as ignorance, what can be viewed as, you know, judgment, why not just ask the questions that are already on your mind? Um, With my, uh, I kind of lost my train of thought, y'all. But as far as the support with my daughter, um, it was kind of like I made my own, my own bubble. So I didn't, once again, didn't really have someone to just kind of jump off of. Where I uh, went to have my daughter, my friend Shardavia, uh, she was having her daughter at the same place. So it was like she was three months ahead of me. And I believe our feeding journeys were a little bit different. But then I also was, you know, kind of dealing with my own mental space, emotional space. So I didn't really feel comfortable with reaching out a lot of times. Um, And then my best friend, uh, Samantha... She ended up having her baby shortly after I did. So it was like, now that I know all the things that I know, I want to educate her and, you know, protect her so that she's not going through any of the same hardships that I'm going through. Because we just talked today about in-laws and, you know, the deep-rooted Southern just myths and stereotypes on feeding kids and, you know outside relatives imposing things on on your your family space um and just setting boundaries and it doesn't always have to be hostile like why can't we just set the boundaries and then you'd be like okay i respect that and then find ways to connect with me further so that way it's not always like a oh i'm stressing out because you about to show up in my house and say something i want you to say or 
ooh, I don't know if I should go visit because she always don't want me to do something that I'm about to do. Like, why we can't just, you know, begin a relationship? Um, I warn my clients about this because I hear it so much. And I suggest to them to create those boundaries before baby even arrives so that the tone is set. Exactly. So I feel like as a birth worker, a lot of the things that I especially would love to do, because I'm doing birth, uh, birth and postpartum planning sessions right now. And I feel like not only through those, I would love to have the family incorporated in the sessions, incorporated in any of the comfort measures, inco- incorporated in anything that is giving them an insight on what this new family is about to do. Because what you do in your household is separate from this new family that's about to bring a baby into the world. And so once you set those boundaries, um, you can really develop long-lasting relationships that benefit you and um, and your family as a whole. That's one thing that I definitely uh, would want to do like for... Uh, baby showers for example like I had a baby shower for my son I didn't have a baby shower for my daughter for various reasons that I will talk about at a later time but even in those settings where we could be talking to our family about hey let's put some money together to get a doula or hey let's get some time together to talk about how I would want to raise my child and these are the ways that you can support me in my upcoming birth since we are here to shower this baby that's going to show up let's shower this mom and the life that's about to begin um all right so i've got like 28 minutes okay Whew. did you have someone to support or encourage you like a hype woman or hype man okay um yeah yes and no because it's like i had people like when you when you talk to your friends or you know outside people to support you, you're always going to have somebody that's like, you know, willing to listen to a certain extent. But I feel like my partner was more of the, you know, here to listen and like he will encourage me in some areas and in other ways that he didn't know would just be like, "Okay, I'm just going to listen to you and in any way I can help, you know, just let me know." But as far as like somebody just when you go to them and they are giving you tips on ways to keep you going instead of shutting down. I feel like my friend Colleen does that. And I don't think I've had a relationship with anybody in a lot of ways that is similar to that where I can come to her with a problem. And she's like, okay, I full fledged support you. This is what you're what you're sounding like to me. And, you know, I'm with it and I'm encouraging you. But hey, how about you start thinking in this perspective? Because if you're in a in a negative space right here, why don't you look a little bit outside the box? And um, did you have someone to vent to or have a shoulder to cry on? Um, yes, yes and no. Because yeah, I had people, but they're all long distance. They're either you know a a few states away, or you know the next city over. Um, But I don't think that I had someone that I was willing to just be free to just say what I wanted to say without it being like, assume that I need you to come up with the solution. Um, Let's see. What expectations did you have for breastfeeding in 2015 and in 2019? So for breastfeeding, I wanted it to be in my mind that I was this... um, milk machine I was just gonna create all this milk it was gonna just flow and my baby was never gonna be hungry was never gonna be you know worrying about anything I wasn't gonna I didn't know anything about discomfort in the ways that I figured out it was um and I didn't know about all the the um natural uncomfortableness that you will begin to feel so with my son you know I was getting frustrated with being completely tired because once you had a baby you're on the adrenaline you're like up because you want to make sure that the baby's not dying nothing is wrong everything's on the up and up you're ready to feed them when you're gonna feed them and all this stuff they try to drill into you as soon as you had a baby on zero sleep and so um i expected to be able to do it with no issues and I was going to just, you know, set this tone and set this standard with no complications. Um, With my daughter, 
I had a little bit more insight and I knew in my heart what I wanted to do was to just get through the hard part, whatever that hard part was going to be and just push through it. When reality set in um, for my son, when it was like, okay, my milk supply is dwindling down. I don't know why. You know, the pumping, I'm not pumping as much. I'm not eating as much. I'm not drinking enough water. I'm not um, really engaging or in tune with my body, in tune with anything at this point. I'm just kind of um, not not really in tune. And my emotions were also connected to my stomach. So it would be like, if I'm not in a good space, I'm not really feeling hungry right now. You know, with my daughter at the hospital, the one thing that concerned me was when she would latch, which I later found out she had a, um, she had a tongue tie and her mouth was super, super small. And my areola was super big and they, you know, you got to put as much of it as you can in there so she can get suction. But you know, there's not going to be the entire thing in her mouth, you know? So I was actually latching, but didn't know that I was doing it successfully. And because her mouth was so small and because of the way that she would latch with the tongue tie, it hurt. So what I did innately was just keep putting her on there. And, you know, they would say, you know, if you're cracking, if you're, um, which I, I think I did have a couple cracks, but if there's pain there, you know, you shouldn't have any pain. When she was suction, it wouldn't be, it would just be the 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 tenderness because I'm constantly being sucked on and it's a new sensation. So I was very sore. I wasn't told that this was normal. And so I just kept doing it. I just, you know, I gritted through it. And what happens when you're breastfeeding immediately after postpartum is what? The uterus is contracting down. And I was feeling a sensation in my thighs, like was aching in pain. My back, my lower back, my stomach, all of that. My uterus was hurting in addition to my nipples. So it was like, okay, um, this is crazy, but I'm going to just keep doing it. Cause I, she's eating every time, you know, she's, she's on this schedule. She is a little sleepy, but I'm keeping at it. And before I knew it, I'm at home and I'm breastfeeding her. It's not really hurting as much. And you know what? I can breastfeed her and put myself on the pump instead of being full of milk. And trying to give her, you know, bottles that I already made. Like, now I can start um, integrating new ways to feed my child. And it wasn't as difficult as it was with my son. The one thing that I did experience with her was I did uh, have a drop in milk supply. And it did scare me. Because I'm like, okay, my daughter is only on breast milk. How is she going to make it with a, um, two ounces or whatever? What What can I do? And so I spent, like times where I was just chugging water which was a little bit extra than what I really needed but I would habitually pump like I would just keep pumping and um I ended up getting my milk supply back up and the most that I had ever been able to make was like six or seven ounces um but for the most part it would be like four to five ounces I was able to pump every couple of hours and stuff like that so I was able to combine bottles and do whatever I needed to do to feed her and um, the only thing was that over time, as I stopped, sometimes you'll get the sense of like not wanting to breastfeed sometimes. And that will start to dwindle my supply. And to where I'm at now, where it's like, I'm pretty sure I don't really have much, but she will want to latch sometimes. And she gets what she can get. Um, what struggles or challenges during breastfeeding slash combo feeding did you have or still currently face? I mean, I pretty much jumped on some of that. Um, until literally right now, you guys recommended me the vegan option of formula, which I'm going to definitely dive into for sure after this. Um, I felt so bad feeling like, okay, I need to try to find formula because I'm not making enough milk anymore and I don't think I can keep doing this with zero help like who is going to work who is going to you know keep the house clean tend to Grayson do all these different things plus breastfeed a child every couple of hours uh, with no breaks so when I started going to the store I started with the with the soy formula 
because I, I just really refused to give her dairy. Like, I was just against the dairy. And so, it seemed like she wasn't really into the soy taste. Like, it was very different than what she had, of course. Um, and I kept trying to give it to her, and it just seemed like she just would not drink it. So then it turned into, okay, if I'm going to buy the formula, the regular just dairy full-fledged formula, I'm going to get the best kind that y'all have, and I'm going to sacrifice and get the $40 formula. And so um, I started getting like Earth's Best and just all the different kinds that were going to be sensitive to her because I didn't want it, you know, her to have uh, lactose uh, sensitivity because I have that and so many other people do because we're not calves. Um, but that's really one of the big things right now is like, I, I feel okay. Cause I feel like she, I, I enjoy feeding her the food that I make her and it being completely organic and she loving every, every bite that I give her, I give her, you know, different seasonings and blends in the food and she enjoys that. So that's been a replacement for the sadness of not being able to just continue the breastfeeding. Like I really used to. Um, what is breastfeeding aversion? And how do you experience this? Or how did you experience this? Everyone is lactose intolerant in some way. Yes, yes, yes. Um, now it's gotten to the point where uh, me personally, I, after having whatever junk I've been consuming, once I start to eat things that are high alkaline or it could just be fruit or I'm drinking um you know a smoothie or a juice or something if there's something there that is not supposed to be I will want to vomit I will feel sick because I'm trying to because my body is essentially what I imagine purging all of that stuff out because I feel sick after eating cheese and all the stuff that I normally would eat so I can only imagine how that affects a baby with that being you know full of vitamins or whatever but added on is this dried pus and all the things that come with uh cow milk and whatever other milks people use goat milk too um <laughs> so breastfeeding aversion so i don't let me pull up the definition so i'm not just like not diving into the whole thing But essentially, the only, like, let me see. Okay, so there's feelings of, um... Feelings of like anger, irritability, coupled with skin itching sensations while the infant is latched and the urgent need to remove the feeding infant. Okay, so I have felt this somewhat with my daughter because it got to a point where, you know, she would look directly at my breasts. I would know exactly that, you know, that she would want to breastfeed. Sometimes I would just want to rest. Sometimes I would just want to like, you know, not be giving my body in so many different ways to everybody but myself. But there were times when she would breastfeed and sometimes I would just kind of want her off of me. She wouldn't be done with her feeding necessarily. And that's why I would just go ahead and pump. But there was just something there that I would feel where it was like, okay, um, I've had enough. Like I need a break. And maybe I will put her back on later on, or maybe I would just give her a bottle that I pumped. But um, I would feel shame and guilt. Like, you know, I'm supposed to be able to just sit here and take that, you know, and get through it. Because that's what's been ingrained in me, that I'm supposed to be, you know, this top-notch superwoman able to handle anything that's thrown. So, um, yeah. I was never told about breastfeeding aversion or ag agitation um, before either, which I think needs to be normalized also. 
Was sex impacted by breastfeeding at any point? If so, how? Hmm. With my son, I wasn't breastfeeding long enough for it to really impact anything. And in that sense, we weren't really just living together until he was, a, you know, almost seven or eight months old. And uh, there, I wasn't breastfeeding anymore. So, but with my daughter, um, no, I don't, I would say that it wasn't, it's not as much of a negative impact. There's more of a liberating feeling I feel now about myself and my body and where I am as a mom versus how I was maybe a year ago or a couple years back. Um, I know for sure at 19, I felt uncomfortable with the fact that I wasn't knowing already that my breasts were not just a sexual object, that they were meant to feed children. So I had already been recognizing it as something that was something that I wasn't even engaging with at all. Like I, they're just there. That's how I was feeling about them. And then whenever there was sex or intercourse involved, it's like, okay, this is what you feel or what sensations you have during these instances. And when a baby is involved, you're not really in a lot of times, you're not really thinking about that when you're with your children. And then when you're with your partner, for some for some people, you will feel that that disconnect on, okay, this is supposed to just solely feed the babies and, and um, you know, no, none of that, you know? And um, I feel like with my daughter, I wouldn't, it, <laughs> it never really got to the point where I was concerned about, you know, my breast, you know, like milk going somewhere or, you know, him putting his mouth on me or anything like that. But I do believe that, for the most part, breastfeeding, stepping into who I identify as a as a woman, as a sexual being in itself, is a much more liberated Stephanie than I was before. So I feel like sex has sex has gone completely to a different place than it was before. With um, like pregnancy, now that was something that that changed. Like we stopped at a certain point. I didn't feel comfortable anymore. And it was just like, okay, with Grayson, it was like, you know, no. With Gianna, it was literally the reason why I had my daughter. Like, it it started the contractions, and now we have baby. And so we were pretty much doing it the entire time with no issues. Other than, you know, I would, you know, uh, have contractions here and there. But it wasn't anything to um, be concerning until it was time to actually have her. Um... So the takeaways that I got from the Latching and Loves Breastfeeding Week, uh, Black Breastfeeding Week event was that, you know, OBGYNs and pediatricians do not study breastfeeding in their curriculum unless they pursue their research on their own and do their due diligence. Most times they do not. So not only, like I said before, I'm going to my child's appointment, which my appointments with my daughter's pediatrician is vastly different than it was with Grayson, but um, with, with this pediatrician that I have, I pretty much set the tone on how all of the visits are going to go. Like she, I'm, I'm already ahead of the game on her. So it's like, when I'm telling her, this is what I'm doing with her. This is how often she's eating. You know, I'm, I'm implementing, you know, elimination communication. I'm doing, you know, this type of uh, baby food or whatever. Like I'm just offering her the knowledge to see where she's at. And she pretty much supports me and wherever I'm going. I ask her for holistic um, ideas on soothing her or whatever. And she offers me those things too, which I am surprised, but it just depends on your provider. Um, be your own advocate. So at 19 years old, I wasn't my own advocate and I wouldn't put that on all 19 year olds. Cause maybe there are some enlightened folks that start young, you know, but where I was at 19 versus where I am right now, um, I didn't know to be my own advocate. I believed in trusting everybody that seemed like they had authority. So that's police, um, doctors, teachers, literally anyone that just presented themselves as such instead of doing the, the research. So with the doctor's aspect, I had the one of the worst ways you can have um, care with my son versus my daughter. Um, and now being a, a former union rights 
a union labor organizer, you know, activist, being all these different things has already put me in a space to speak how I feel and not feel ashamed about where I am and to ask questions and not feel, you know, some type of way, making sure that people know what they're supposed to know before they can offer you any type of, you know, insight is always the way to go. Um, ask questions on supplementing and what you, what you mean by that and how long for it. So, um, there was, there was a, uh, a note to like a gym that was dropped as far as the pediatrician aspect. Like when they, if you've ever been told, you know, Hey, you should supplement your child. Cause it seems like, you know, you're not really breastfeeding as much as you really, uh, should be, or as much as you think you should. So just go ahead and supplement. So they just leave it at that or you go to the WIC office and they leave it at that and you don't really know what to to just do from there. So you should ask, what do you mean by supplementing? What should I supplement with? How long should I supplement? Should I also be trying to pump and get my milk supply back up while I'm supplementing, as you say? Um, And the other takeaway that I felt was very important was changing the narrative of what a black woman and a black mother is. Um, There is so many different stereotypes on what um, a black woman is supposed to be, and we can talk about that all day. But um, being alone in hardship is one of the biggest things that I feel like needs to be broken down. Because, yes, you do need your space, and you do need to be alone with your family as a whole. And no, everybody doesn't have to constantly question you. Like, hey, how you doing? How you doing? You know? But having true community, true, like, support and wanting to be there for you, even if it's not doing anything, just giving you that space to vent and breathe, I believe that's a way that we can stop having people being alone in hardship. Not just in parenthood, but in every aspect of life. Um, And being suppressed by others Meaning that being, you know, um, gaslighted, being told, oh, you're just, you're just over exaggerating or, you know, no, it's not like that. Not being able to express your feelings without someone having something to say that makes you feel like, you know, maybe I'm tripping when I'm not tripping. Um, so what do you plan to do since I got seven minutes? What do you plan to do to see this type of support for birthing people in Houston, the South, and beyond? So the type of support that I would want, which I believe I forgot to talk about return to work. um, I would love to offer return to work support because there are laws in place for your employer to ensure that you have a space to return to where you can um, breastfeed and store your milk during your shifts. Um, And there was a woman that I worked with, a friend of mine. Her name is Elizabeth. Um, And she was the first person I'd ever seen packing a pump to work and storing it in a refrigerator that they told us we couldn't store stuff in. And we had no, you know, fridges. If we had known about the laws, then will we have, you know, acted on those? Um, but I would love to create just like similar to Latching in Love where she has, um, breastfeeding support groups, having virtual sessions to talk to, uh, moms, allowing them to have space to really just either get things off their chest or get insight on ways to be supported through breastfeeding in whatever ways that they would like that. Um, and not just in Houston, not just in Texas, um, all over the country and beyond because what I'm noticing is a lot of these death rates, a lot of these, you know, issues that are revolving around black birth. Um, it's happening in these slave states, in these Southern states, in these right to work states. Um, and we have to get closer and closer to breaking down this society that we believe has to be the norm forever. Even if I don't see this in my lifetime, I would like to begin connecting with moms, especially after they've had a baby. Because I know a lot of women that saw my posts about being a doula, 
Wasn't really sure what that was. Felt like they didn't need it. Now they've had their baby. And now I still want to reach out to you to come to your home or to talk to you virtually to see how you're doing. Not just to get some money, not just to, you know, do something to boost myself up, but to also take care of you so that you are not another woman that we lose, hopefully. Um, And we also just build community. One baby at a time, one mom at a time, one um, birthing person at a time, because it's not just women having babies out here. So, yeah, that was pretty much everything that I wanted to get off my chest. Um, I feel like breastfeeding was and is one of the ways that I was able to be a freer being, not only for myself, but for my daughter, learning about how important it is for your child to come through the vagina, to get that microbiome from your from that area, as well as your breast milk from your breast itself, so that that goes into your gut. The fact that those microbiomes, those um, organisms that are inside your gut, are the same ones that your mom, your grandma, her mom, your foremothers have had, and I'm passing that on to Gianna and whoever other you know whatever other baby I may pass that on to. The fact that I'm able to create a healthier child by breastfeeding. I didn't know what power I had until I was able to do it this time around. And I thank myself and I thank my breasts. I thank my body for being able to contribute to my life the way that it has and being able to share this space now in 2020 um, at 24 years old. And um, yeah, I, I appreciate everyone that either stopped in um, or listen to me the entire time or will listen to this video later on. I appreciate you taking the time to share this space with me. Um, I am forever grateful. And this is just one of many uh, discussions I will have in the future. So yeah, uh, do not forget to follow. I guess I should throw in those because I'm, I'm not a YouTuber, y'all. I'm, I'm not a social media person. So my Instagram is Rose Gold Birth. Follow me. Uh, my personal one is of the tribe. Um, but yeah, I appreciate you. Thank you for your word. Yes, thank you. Forever and always, Kelly. I appreciate you. Um, yeah, so I'm going to get off. Um, love you guys and see you on the next one.